Hello and welcome to this exploring session, this Beyond Shakespeare exploring session of the Massacre at Paris, otherwise known as the Duke of Guise or just the Massacre. Uh, and in this, that spirit, I should point out, uh, there is an important trigger warning to be issued here. It's called the title. Um, it pretty much covers any, any element of this play that's probably going to be triggering. There's a lot of death. Uh, there's uh, a lots of death in various different guises or uh, or guises, and cool. um, it does move forward in a, a relatively non cheerful fashion. Hence the fact that I am desperately trying to introduce some sort of frivolity this early on in proceedings. The play is by Christopher Marlowe. It's almost certainly one of the last things he ever wrote before his life was abridged by a sharp pointy thing in the eye. Um, it is also, for that matter, quite a short play, but even so it is quite a lot for us to be getting through in one session. Not as long as Dido, Queen of Carthage, um, which was indeed definitely um, bladder uh, re resistant, shall we say. Um, there was, there was a, a certainly, uh, that was a bit of a strain for many of us. So this is slightly shorter and we're not going to be doing quite as much discussion as we normally would. We're going to be rattling straight into the text and uh, pausing probably about a third, maybe even halfway through before we talk about what on earth we're living through. I am Robert Crichton and I am doing the stage directions, but we have a whole host of voice talent for you here on Zoom. And just very quickly going through the room, reading Charles uh, Montserrat, um, first man and pleshy is... Well, my name's Stephen Longstaff. I'm a scholar of early modern drama. And reading Navarre, uh, a lord, a Mugaron, a murderer one is... Hello, my name is Sasha Cooper, and I'm a professional actress, dancer, choreographer, and general all-round performer based in Brighton. And reading the Admiral Lorraine Ramos, second man, Bartus, and murderer two is... Hi, I'm Greg, and I'm from Stratford Maven. Oh. And reading the Guise, and messenger number one is... Hi, my name's Hayden, I live in Bury St Edmunds in Suffolk. And reading uh, Catherine, Saroon, uh, Teleus, uh, Murderer 3, and a Surgeon is... Hello, my name is Lindsay Beecham. I'm a professional actor and currently self-isolating in Norfolk. And uh, reading Anjou, later to be a king, is... Muted at present. Still Hello. muted. Hello, I'm unmuted now, unfettered. Um, my name is Jack Chandler. I'm an actor, singer, and voice artist uh, from Kent. And uh, reading the apothecary, uh, Duman, a uh, Saroon's wife, Cardinal Joyo, and a captain is. My name's Pamela. I'm a professional actor based in London. And reading uh, Conde, Admiral's Man, Cutpurse, and Messenger number two is. Um, my name is Alex Scott Fairley, and I'm an actor from the Highlands of Scotland. And uh, reading uh, Margaret uh, Gonzago Eponon and the Duchess of Guise is... Hi, I'm Christine Johansson, and I'm a scholar of early modern drama and an occasional actress in Amsterdam. And uh, uh, reading The Old Queen and Maid is... Liza Graham, actor and singer and Shakespearean text coach in London. And uh, reading all the soldiers and and a friar <laughs> is. I'm Rob, and I live just outside Ely in Cambridgeshire. And uh, reading a uh, Protestant, uh, the Guise son, uh, Rites, uh, and uh, or Ritz, or uh, is currently muted. Tom. Hi, I'm Tom. I'm a professional director based in New York, working mostly on mystery plays and not medieval plays. Okay. Uh, have I missed anyone in the room? No, I think I've managed to cover everybody, uh, if not in uh, accuracy, but at least with enthusiasm, because there will be some, some names which uh, our pronunciation, certainly my pronunciation, will vary randomly from scene to scene. So, without further ado, let us get down into the action of the play, The Massacre at Paris with the death of the Duke 
of Guise. So, scene one, mm. enter Charles, the French king, Catherine, the queen mother, the king of Navarre, the prince of Condé, the lord high admiral, and Margaret, the queen of Navarre, with others. Prince of Navarre, my honourable brother, Prince Condé, and my good lord admiral, I wish this union and religious league knit in these hands, thus joined in nuptial rites, may not dissolve till death dissolve our lives, and that the native sparks of princely love that kindled first this motion in our hearts may still be fueled in our progeny. The many favours which your grace has shown from time to time, but especially in this, shall bind me ever to your highness' will, in what Queen Mother or Your Grace commands. Thanks, son Navarre. You see we love you well, that link you in marriage with our daughter here. And, as you know, our difference in religion might be a means to cross you in your love. Well, madam, let that rest. And now, my lords, the marriage rites performed, we think it good to go and consummate the rest with hearing of an holy mass. Sister, I think yourself will bear us company. I will, my good lord. The rest that will not go, my lords, may stay. Come, mother, let us go to honour this solemnity. Which I'll dissolve with blood and cruelty. Oh, exuant all except the King of Navarre, Condé and the Admiral. Prince Condé and my good lord Admiral, now Guise may storm, but does us little hurt, having the king, queen mother on our side, to stop the malice of his envious heart that seeks to murder all the Protestants. Have you not heard of late how he decreed, if that the king had given consent thereto, that all the Protestants there are in Paris? Should I have been murdered the other night? And... My, my lord, I marvel that the aspiring Guise dares once adventure without the king's assent to meddle or attempt such dangerous things. My lord, you need not marvel at the Guise, for what he doth the Pope will ratify in murder, mischief, or in tyranny. But he that sits and rules above the clouds doth hear and see the prayers of the just, and will revenge the blood of innocence that Guise hath slain by treason of his heart, and brought by murder to their timeless ends. My lord, but did you mark the cards on the Guise's brother, the Duke de Maine, how they did storm these your nuptial rites, because the house of Bourbon now comes in and joins your lineage to the crown of France? And that's the cause that Guise so frowns at us, and beats his brains to catch us in his trap which he has pitched within his deadly toil. Come, my lords, let us go to the church and pray that God may still defend the right of France and make his gospel flourish in this land. Exuant into scene two and enter the Duke of Guise alone. If ever Hymen lowered at marriage rites and had his altars decks with dusty lights, if ever sun stained heaven with bloody clouds and made it look with terror on the world, if ever day were turned to ugly night and night made semblance of the hue of hell, this day, this hour, this fatal night shall fully show the fury of them all. Apothecary. Enter the apothecary. My lord. Now shall I prove and guerdon to the full the love thou bearest unto the house of Guise. Where are those perfumed gloves which I late I sent to be poisoned? Hast thou done them? Speak, will every saver breed a pank of death? See where they be, my lord, and he that smells but to them dies. Then thou remainest resolute. I am, my lord, in what your grace commands till death. Thanks, my good friend. I will requite thy love. Go then, present them to the Queen Navarre, for she is that huge blemish in our eye that makes these upstart heresies in France. Be gone, my friend. Present them to her straight. 
soldier. Exit apothecary. Enter a soldier. My lord. Now, come thou forth and play thy tragic part. Stand in some window opening near the street, and when thou seest the admiral ride by, discharge thy musket and perform his death. And then I'll guerdon thee with store of crowns. I will, my lord. Exit, soldier. Now, Guise, begin those deep, engendered thoughts to burst abroad. Those never dying flames which cannot be extinguished but by blood. Oft have I leveled and at last have learned that peril is the chiefest way to happiness, and resolution honors fairest aim. What glory is there in a common good that hangs for every peasant to achieve? That like I best that flies beyond my reach. Set me to scale the high perimeters, and therefore on the diadem of France, I'll either rend it with my nails to naught, or mount the top with my aspiring wings, although my downfall be the deepest hell. For this, I wake when others think I sleep. For this I wait that scorn attendance else. For this my quenchless thirst whereon I build hath often pledged kindred to the king. For this, this head, this heart, this hand and sword contrive, imagine and fully execute matters of import aimed at by many, yet understood by none. For this hath heaven engendered me of earth, for this the earth sustains my body's weight, and with this weight I'll counterpoise a crown, or with seditions weary all the world. For this, from Spain, the stately Catholic sends Indian gold to coin me French accuse. For this have I a largesse from the Pope, a pension and a dispensation too. And by that privilege to work upon, my policy have framed religion. <laughs> religion. Oh, diable. Fie, I am ashamed, however that I seem, to think a word of such a simple sound, of so great matter should be made the ground. The gentle king, whose pleasure uncontrolled, weakeneth his body, and will waste his realm, if I repair not what he knew ruineth. Him as a child I daily win with words, so that for proof he barely bears the name, I execute, and he sustains the blame. And the mother queen works wonders for my sake, and in my love entombs the hopes of France rifling the bowels of her treasury to supply my wants and necessities. Paris hath full five hundred colleges, as monasteries, priories, abbeys, and halls, wherein are thirty thousand able men, besides a thousand sturdy Jews and Catholics, and more. Of my knowledge, in one cloister keep five hundred fat Franciscus friars and priests. All this and more, if more may be comprised to bring the will of our desires to end. Then, Guise, since thou hast all the cards within thy hands to shuffle or to cut, take this as surest thing, that right or wrong thou dealest thyself a king. Aye, but Navarre, Tis but a nook of France, sufficient yet for such a petty king, that with a rabblement of his heretics blinds Europe's eyes and troubleth our estate. Him will we. But first, let's follow those in France that hinder our possession to the crown. As Caesar to his soldiers, so say I. Those that hate me will I learn to loathe. Give me a look that when I bend the brows, pal death may walk in furrows on my face, 
a hand that with a grasp may grip the world, an ear to hear what my detractors say, a royal seat, a scepter, and a crown, that those which do behold them may become as men that stand and gaze against the sun. The cloth is laid, and things shall come to pass where resolution strives for future. Exit the geese, and of course, gesticulating there in the middle with his sword, a stage direction I, I failed to read out there. Um, we move into scene three, enter the King of Navarre, Queen Margaret, the old Queen of Navarre, the Prince of Condé, the Admiral, and most importantly, the apothecary with the gloves, and gives them to the old Queen. Madame, I beseech your grace to accept this simple gift. Thanks, my good friend. Hold, take thou this reward. I humbly thank your majesty. And exit the apothecary. Methinks the gloves have a very strong perfume, the scent whereof doth make my head to ache. Doth not your grace know the man that gave them you? Uh, not well, but do, do remember such a man. Your grace was ill-advised to take them then, considering of these dangerous times. Help, son Navarre! I am poisoned! Heavens forbid, your highness, such mishap. The late suspicion of the Duke of Guise may well have moved your highness to beware. How did you meddle with such dangerous gifts? Too late, it, too late it is, my lord, if that be true to blame her highness. But I hope it be only some natural passion makes her sick. Oh, no, sweet Margaret! The fatal poison doth work within my heart. My brain pan breaks. My heart doth faint. I die. She dies. My mother poisoned here before my face. Oh, gracious God, what times are these? Oh, grant, sweet God, my days may end with hers, that I with her may die and live again. Let not this heavy chance, my dearest Lord, for whose effects my soul is massacred, infect thy gracious breast with fresh supply to aggravate our sudden misery. My lords, let us bear her body hence and see it honoured with just solemnity. And as they are going, enter a soldier who, uh, above, discharges his musket at the Lord Admiral and exits. Bang! Ah! What? Ah! Are you hurt, my Lord High Admiral? Hi, my good lord, shot through the arm. Navarre. Nope, we are betrayed. Come, my lords, and let us go tell the king of this. These are the cursed Gysians that do seek our death. How fatal was this marriage to us all. Exuant as they bear away the body of the old queen of Navarre. We move into scene four. Enter Charles the King, Catherine the Queen Mother, the Duke of Guise, Duke Anjou, Duke de Maine, and Cousin, and Captain of the King's Guards, etc. My noble son and princely Duke of Guise, now have we got the fatal straggling deer within the compass of a deadly toil, and as we late decreed, we may perform. Madam, it will be noted through the world an action bloody and tyrannical chiefly since, under safety of our word, they justly challenge their protection. Beside my heart relents that noblemen, only corrupted in religion, ladies of honour, knights and gentlemen, should for their conscience taste such ruthless ends. Though gentle minces should pity others' pains, yet will the wisest note their proper griefs, and rather seek to scourge their enemies they be themselves base subjects to the whip. Methinks, my lord, Anjou have well advised your highness to consider of the thing, and rather choose to seek your country's good than pity or relieve these upstart heretics. I hope these reasons may serve my princely son to have some care for fear of enemies. Well, madam, I refer it to your majesty and to my nephew here, the Duke of Guise. What you determine, I will ratify. Thanks to my princely son. Then tell me, Guise, what order will you set down for the massacre? Thus, madam, 
they that shall be actors in this massacre shall wear white crosses on their Bergenets and tie white linen scarves about their arms. He that wants these and is suspect of heresy shall die, or be he king or emperor. Then I'll have a pearl of ordnance shot from the tower, at which they all shall issue out at set streets. And then the watchword being given, a bell shall ring, which when they hear, they shall begin to kill, and never cease until that bell shall cease. Then breathe a while. Enter the Admiral's man. How now, fellow? What news? And it please your grace, the Lord High Admiral, riding the streets, was traitorously shot, and most humbly entreats your majesty to visit him sick in his bed. Messenger, tell him I will see him straight. Exit, messenger. What shall we do now with the Admiral? Your majesty had best go visit him and make a show as if all were well. Content. I will go visit the Admiral. And I will go take order for his death. Exit Guise, enter the Admiral in his bed. How fares it with my Lord High Admiral? Hath he been hurt with villains in the street? I vow and swear, as I am King of France, to find and to repay the man with death. With death delayed and torments never used, that durst presume the hope of any gain, that hurt the noble man his sovereign loves. Ah, oh, my good lord, these are the Giesians that seek to massacre our guiltless lives. Assure yourself, my good lord admiral, I deeply sorrow for your treacherous wrong, and that I am not more secure myself than I am careful you should be preserved. Cousin, take twenty of our strongest guard, and under your direction see they keep all treacherous violence from our noble friend, repaying all attempts with present death upon the cursed breakers of our peace. And so be patient, good Lord Admiral, and every hour I will visit you. And they exit, moving into scene five, enter the Guise, Anjou, Domaine, uh, Gonzaga, Rete, uh, Montserrat, and soldiers to the massacre. Anjou, Domaine, Gonzago, Rete, swear by the argent crosses on your Bergenet to kill all that you suspect of heresy. I swear by this to be unmerciful. I am disguised and none knows who I am and therefore mean to murder all I meet. And so will I. And I. Away then, break into the Admiral's house. I let the Admiral be first dispatched. The Admiral, chief standard bearer to the Lutherans, shall in the entrance of this massacre be murdered in his bed. Gonzago, conduct them hither, and then beset his house that not a man may live. That charge is mine. Swizzers, keep you the streets, and at each corner shall the king's guard stand. Come, sirs, follow me. Exit Gonzago and others with him. Cousin, the captain of the Admiral's guard, placed by my brother, will betray his lord. Now, Guise, shall Catholics flourish once again, the head being of the members cannot stand. But look, my lord, there's some in the Admiral's house. Enter, above Gonzago and others, into the Admiral's house, and he in his bed. In lucky time, let, come, let us keep this lane, and slay his servants that shall issue out. Where is the Admiral? Oh, let me pray before I die. Then pray unto Our Lady, kiss this cross. Oh, Stabs God. him. Oh God, forgive my sins. What, is he dead, Gonzago? Aye, my lord. Then throw him down. The body is thrown down. And exuant Gonzago and the rest above. Now, cousin, view him well. Maybe it is some other. And he escaped. Cousin, tis he. I know him by his look. See, where my soldier shot him through the arm. He missed him near, but we have struck him now. Ah, base Chatillon and degenerate, chief standard bearer to the Lutherans. Thus, in despite of thy religion, the Duke of Guise stamps on thy lifeless bulk. Away with him. Cut off his head and hands, and send them for a present to the 
send them for a present to the Pope. And when his just revenge is finished, unto Mount Falson will we drag his course, and he that living hated so the cross shall be dead, be hanged there on in chains. Anjou Gonzago it is. If that you three will be as resolute as I and Domaine, there shall not a Huguenot breath in France. I swear by this cross, we'll not be partial, but slay as many as we can, other come near. Monsorel, go and shoot off the ordinance. But they which have already set the street may know their watchword, and then bowl the bell. And so, let's forward the massacre. I will, my lord. Exit, Monsorel. And now, my lord, let us closely to our business. And joy will follow thee. And so will Dumaine. And an ordinance is shot off, bang, and the bell tolls. Come then. Let's away. So the Guise and the rest with their swords drawn chase Protestants. Two, two, two. Let none escape. Murder the Huguenots. Kill them. Kill them. And they exit. Enter Lorraine running, the Guise and the rest pursuing him. Lorraine, Lorraine, follow Lorraine. Sirrah, are you a preacher of these heresies? I am a preacher of the word of God, and thou a traitor to thy soul and him. Dearly beloved brother, thus tis written. And he stabs ah. him. Stay, my lord, let me begin the psalm. Come, drag him away and throw him in a ditch. Exuant, and uh, in scene uh, six, enter Monsoreau and knocks at Saron's door. Who is it that knocks there? Monsoreau from the Duke of Guise. Husband? Come down. Here's one would speak with you from the Duke of Guise. And enter her husband. To speak with me from such a man as he? Aye, aye. For this, Serun, and thou shalt hat. And showing his dagger. Oh, let me pray before I take my death. Well, dispatch then, quickly. Oh, Christ, my saviour. Christ? Villain? Why dost thou presume to call on Christ without the intercession of some saint? Sanctus Jacobus, he was my saint, pray to him. Oh, let me pray unto my God. And take this with you. Stabs him, he falls and dies. They exit. Next scene, enter Ramus in his study. If a cries come from the river Seine, the fright poor Ramus sitting at his book. I fear the Gisians have passed the bridge and mean once more to menace me. Enter Talius. Fly, Ramus, fly, if thou wilt save thy life. Tell me, Tanius, wherefore should I fly? The Gizians are hard at thy door and mean to murder me. Hark, hark, they come. I'll leap out the window. Runs out from the study. Wait, Tanius, stay. Enter Gonzaga and Ritty. Who goes there? Tanius, Ramus, bedfellow. What art thou? I am, as Ramus is, a Christian. Oh, let him go. He is Catholic. Exit. Tell us. Enter Ramus from again out of his study. Come, Ramus, more gold, or thou shalt have the stab. Alas, I am but a scholar. How should I have gold? All that I have is but my stipend from the king, which is no sooner received but is spent. And then enter unto them the Guise and Anjou, Domaine, Montserrat, others, soldiers, etc. Anjou. Uh, on to you again, please. Who oh, have you there? It's Ramus, the king's professor of logic. Huh. Stab him. Oh, good, my lord, wherein have Ramus been so offentious? Marry, sir, in having a smack in all, and yet did never sound anything to the depth. Was it not thou that scoffed the Oregon and said it was a heap of vanities? He that will be a flat dichotomist and see in nothing but epitomies is in your judgment thought a learned man. And he, forsooth, must go and preach in Germany. Excepting against doctors' actions, 
and ipse dixi with this quiddity. Argumentum testimonis est in arte partialis. To, uh, to contradict which I say Ramus shall die. How answer you that? Your nego argumentum cannot serve, sirrah. Kill him. Oh, but my lord, let me even speak a word. Well, say on. Not for my life do I desire this pause, but in my latter hour to purge myself, in that I know the things that I have wrote, which, as I hear, one shekins takes it ill, because my places being but three contain all his. I know the organon to be confused, and I reduced it into better form. And for this Aristotle will I say that he hath dis he, that he that despised him can ne'er be good in logical philosophy. And that's because the blockish Sorbonists attribute as much unto their works as to the service of the inter internal God. Oh, why suffer you that peasant to declaim? Stab him, I say, and send him to his friends in hell. <laughs> there was their collier's son so full of pride. And ah. they kill him. My lord Anjou, there are a hundred Protest Protestants which we have chased into the river Seine, that swim about and so preserve their lives. How may we do? I fear me they will live. Go place some men upon the bridge with bows and carts to shoot at them they see and sink them in the river as they swim. Ah, tis well advised, Domain. Go see it done. Exit, Domain. And in the meantime, my lord, could we devise to get those pedants from the King Navarre that are tutors to him and the Prince of Condé? For that, let me alone. Cousin, stay here, and when you see me in, don't follow hard. He knocketh, and enter the King of Navarre and Prince of Condé with their schoolmasters. How oh, now, my lord? How fare you? My lord, they say that all the Protestants are massacred. Aye, so they are. But yet, what remedy? I have done all I could to stay this broil. But yet, my lord, the report doth run that you were the one that made this massacre. Who I? You are deceived. I rose but now. And the Guise enters unto them. Murder the Huguenots. Take those pedants hence. Thou traitor, Guise, lay of thy bloody hands. Come, let us go tell the king. The exuant Condé and Navarre. Come, sirs, I'll whip you to death with my poignite point. And he kills them. Yeah. Oh, them both. Ex you exit Anjou with a body and soldiers with the bodies. And now, sirs, for this night let our fury stay. Yet will we not the massacre shall end? Gonzago poses. Gonzago, posse you to Orleans, retes to Deb, Montsorel unto Rhone, and spare not one that you suspect of heresy. And now stay that bell that to the devil's matin dooms. Now every man put on his burgeonet and so convey him closely to his bed. Exuant. And there we will pause. There is some method to my madness in terms of driving the pace through that because one of the questions that I think is quite important with this play is do you follow who is who and how do we convey that data and for that matter does it matter precisely who most of these uh, peripheral characters are um, uh, admittedly we're able to look down and see uh, names on the scripts as we go uh, but just the sense of what's been happening in this first 25 minutes or so of action, um, uh, the pacing would be different. Some of it would be much faster. Some of it may be a bit slower, taking its time. Um, but that imp your impressions of this first third or so of the text, uh, wave your arm at me to, uh, to speak, please. I see uh, Mr. McCabe. Uh, to me, it went at a fair pace. I don't, I don't, it didn't seem to lapse anywhere. Hmm. 
but uh, in terms of narrative and 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 narrative, drive, um, well, I've, I've been looking at it all day, so <laughs> I can't really comment. But, you know, I mean, whether an audience member would actually understand what's going on from what we've done is, I don't know. Mm. Um, you know, we, we there are um, a lot of peripheral characters, as you say. Yeah, we've got a very good idea that the geese is a wrong one. I don't think anyone has a problem with that as a basic concept. Um, but how far, you know, what do we think of Anjou and who he is? Um, uh, 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 and uh, what do we think of uh, of of the other um, people who occasionally throw aside? I think most of the peripheral sort of massacrers um, are are very forgettable in terms of the, you know their names. They do some action. They kill they kill some people. Um, yeah. Thoughts on the room. Thoughts on the room. Well, it's an already existing story, isn't it? Yeah. So. Um, people aren't necessarily going to be relying on the play mm. for their understanding of what happens. Uh, you know, there may, there may be, I mean, there was tons and tons of pamphlets about this. You know, it was the kind of, you know, 9-11 of Protestant Europe, you know, it was just this terrible, terrible day. Uh, and so perhaps what's happening in this, this opening is some of those stories that, you know, lots of people would have known about in some form or other being presented to as kind of little vignettes. Mm. Just really quickly, this is this is the you know this is the pedants being killed. This is the schoolmasters. This is the great Ramus being killed. Right. Okay. We've got, we've got all of those in the play technically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, everybody's expecting that, but to make sense of it, we have to do something else dramatically. Mm -hmm. Perhaps. Mm -hmm. So perhaps it's the pre-existing story. Mm -hmm. Alex, I saw you waggling your hand. Yeah, I, I've, I've actually seen this, I think I mentioned to you, a, a very long time ago when I was still at school. So that, that is a very, very long time ago. I mean, that's, that's a like day trip to the massacre. It, it, it genuinely was, and it was, it was done on the fringe somewhere. So I'm kind of talking like mid 90s, I think, late 90s. And I remember it being absolutely bewilderingly confusing at the time. Um, and I think there probably is a difference in the way that uh, a contemporary audience at the time would interpret it and if you were to put it on its feet now mm. I think if you were put it, to put it on its feet now either you've got to make the point that it is bewildering and confusing and nobody knows exactly who is on whose side as I imagine would happen if you were in a similar situation today with people marauding through the streets um, or you would have to make very very clear decisions about exactly what people look like um, particularly if you are multi-rolling this, because even just sitting and listening to it, mm. um, I, I'm having to catch up. You know, I, I, I don't have that much to say uh, so far, but I'm having to look at the speech prefixes and do some very quick thinking in my head as someone who is not particularly au fait with 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 the massacre of the the the, um, the, the Huguenot. Um, and to go back to your original point as well, that it wasn't very jolly. Um, it doesn't chime much with Easter, but reading it really struck me. It's the first night of Passover tonight um, and it's exactly the same premise as Passover that you skip the houses that have the the right people in it mm. and the marking with the white cross of the, the on the version um, mm. really resonated with me uh, yes so. the, as a visual signifier we do have they're wearing um, mm. they're, they're marking themselves up so so once the massacre starts we know exactly who's on what side mm. uh, whereas in the court it is uh, you, it has to be presumably followed by dialogue there, there may be other costuming signifiers that we can throw in um and um yeah, that, that 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 question of are we supposed to enjoy you know the massacre you know is this uh you know what element of this uh is entertainment i think going back to stephen's point it reminds me dramaturgically of uh, the first harry potter film um which is sort of a selection of bits from a book without necessarily being a properly thought structured film if that makes sense it's like we've got to have this bit 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 um and that's sort of a, as a weird parallel um in my mind uh, there other thoughts in the room floored you with my random harry potter reference okay um <laughs> Um, yes, I mean it's that thing. It's 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 a relatively recent history to the uh, the, the the original audience, um, but we are looking at it from a very very different perspective. Um, and what is it about twenty years? 
it's, it's something like that. I can I can find the precise date. So um, the yeah, actual massacre itself years. is uh, 1572, and this play comes out about 20 years later. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Ah, okay. Um, uh, yes. Yes, Liza. And th there's a personal connection for Marlowe too. Marlowe uh, worked, we think, probably for Sir Thomas Walsingham. Um, Walsingham had a lot of people in his pay. Uh, Marlowe was one of them. Um, and Walsingham had been at the massacre as a young man. In fact, the English agent at the end may be a reference to him. Oh, oh really? Ah, yeah, of course. Um, like that. Um, so yes, um, it's, 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 it's very active, this first sort of third or so. Um, maybe it's going to calm down a little bit and we may just find a, an extension of a plot starting to develop. Um, let's, let's see where we go with that. There's some horrible images being thrown at us. There's also sound, as remember, we've got bells in some fashion involved in the soundscape here. Um, uh, the bangs and crashes uh, going on as well. So there's there's all sorts of things that this gives you the idea of of a massacre um, and its confusion. And we see where we go from here. We get a little bit of an in breath in the massacre because we have a scene with uh, with Anjou doing a, a bit of a speechette to uh, to uh, two lords of Poland apparently. So uh, enter Anjou with two lords of Poland. My lords of Poland, I must needs confess the offer of your prince's electors far beyond the reach of my deserts. For Poland is, as I have inform been informed, a martial people worthy such a king as hath sufficient counsel in himself to lighten doubts and frustrate subtle foes. And such a king whom practice long hath taught to please himself with manage of the wars, the greatest wars within our Christian bounds. I hear our wars against the Muscovites and on the other side against the Turk, rich princes both, the mighty emperors, yet by my brother Charles, our king of France, and by his grace counsel, it is thought, that if I undertake to wear the crown of Poland, it may be prejudice their hope of my inheritance to the crown of France. For if the Almighty take my brother hence, by due regal descent and the regal seat, sorry, by due descent, the regal seat is mine. With Poland, therefore, must I covenant thus, that if by death of Charles, the diadem of Tr France, be cast on me, then with your leaves I retire me to my native home. If your commission serve me to warrant this, I thankfully shall undertake the charge of you and yours and carefully maintain the wealth and safety of your kingdom's right. All this and more your highness shall command for Poland's crown and kingly diadem. Then come, lords, let's go. And they exit, enter into a very different scene. Enter two men, first and second man, two with the admiral's body from earlier. Now, yes. Sarah. Oh, come. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, uh, there's, uh, there's ah. a f first man is Stephen, second man is Gregory. Thank you. Gosh, Sarah, what should we do with the admiral? Why let us burn him for a heretic? Oh no, his body will infect the fire and the fire the air and we'll be poisoned with him. What shall we do then? Let's, uh, let's throw him in the river. Oh, it will corrupt the water and the water the flat fish and the fish ourselves when we eat them. Throw him in a ditch? Oh no, no, to decide all doubts be ruled by me. Let's hang him upon this tree. Agreed. They hang him. Um, enter the Duke of Guise and Queen Mother and the Cardinal of Lorraine. Now, madam, how like you our lusty admiral? 
Believe me, Guise, he becomes the place so well that I could long ere this have wished him there. But come, let's walk aside. The air's not very sweet. No, by my faith, madam. Sirs, take him away and throw him in, in some ditch. They carry now, away the dead body. And now, madam, as I understand, there are a hundred Huguenots and more which in the woods do hold their synagogue and daily meet about this time of day. Thither will I put them to the sword. Do so, sweet Guise, let us delay no time, for if these stragglers gather head again and disperse themselves throughout the realm of France, it will be hard for us to work their deaths. Madam, I go as well Wincy's rage before a storm. And exit the Guise. My lord of Lorraine, have you marks of late how Charles our son begins for to lament for the late night's work? which my Lord of Guise did make in Paris among the Huguenites? Madam, I have heard him solemnly vow with the rebellious King of Navarre for to revenge their deaths upon us all. Aye, but my Lord, let me alone for that. For Catherine must have her will in France. As I do live, so surely shall he die. And Henry then shall wear the diadem. And if he grudge or cross his mother's will, I'll disinherit him and all the rest. For I'll rule France, but they shall wear the crown. And if they storm, I then may pull them down. Come, my lord, let's go. Exuant. E enter five or six Protestants with books and kneel together. Enter also the Guise and others. Down with the Huguenites, murder them. Oh, Monsieur de Guise, hear me but speak. No, villain, no, that tongue of thine that hath blasphemed the holy church of Rome shall drive no plaints into the Guise's ears. To make the justice of my heart relent, ah, who to, to let none escape. And they <laughs> kill the Protestants. So, drag them away. And they ex you exit with the bodies. Into the next scene, enter Charles, King of France, Navarre, and Eponon, saying, uh, staying uh, him, enter Queen Mother and the Cardinal of Lorraine and Pleshy. Let me stay and rest me here a while. A griping pain has ceased upon my heart. A sudden pang, the messenger of death, Oh, say not so, thou killst thy mother's heart. I must say so. Pain forces me to complain. Comfort yourself, my lord. I have no doubt, but God will sure restore you to your health. Oh, no. My loving brother of Navarre. I have deserved a scourge, I must confess. Yet is there patience of another sort than to misdo the welfare of their king. God grant my nearest friends may prove no worse. Hold me up. My sight begins to fail. My sinews shrink. My brain turns upside down. My heart doth break. I faint and die. And indeed he dies. What art thou dead, sweet son? Speak to thy mother. Oh no, his soul is fled from out his breast. And he nor hears nor sees us what we do. My lords, what resteth now for to be done, but that we presently dispatch ambassadors to Poland to call Henry back again, to wear his brother's crown and dignity. Eponoon, go see it presently be done, and bid him come without delay to us. Madam, I will. And now, my lords, after these funerals be done, we will, with all the speed we can, provide for Henry's coronation from Polonia. Come, let us take his body hence. And they all go out, presumably with the body, except for Navarre and Pleshy. And now, Navarre, whilst that these broils do last, my opportunity may serve me fit to steal from France and hide me to my home for he is no safety in the realm for me. And now that Henry is called from Poland, it is my due by just succession, 
and therefore, as speedily as I can perform, I'll usher up an army secretly, for fear that Guise joined with the King of Spain might seek to cross me in mine enterprise. But God that always doth defend the right will shew his mercy and preserve us still. The virtues of our poor religion cannot but march with many graces more, whose army shall discomfort all your foes, and at the length in Pampelonia crown, in spite of Spain and all the popish power that hoards it from your highness wrongfully, your majesty, her rightful lord and sovereign. Truth, say she, and God so prosper me in all, as I intend to labour for the truth, and true profession of his holy word. Come, Pleshy, let's away while time doth serve. And we will pause there. We're past the halfway mark, pretty much. Um, so we've got a, uh, a series of uh, political manoeuvrings becoming much more clear, much more important than the massacre itself, uh, to my mind. Uh, a little bit of dark comedy uh, with the men with the admiral's body. The admiral is the man who just won't die. Um, and I don't know um, if others uh, agree with me. It feels awfully like the death of Pilot uh, episode from, uh, I think it's the, is it Cornish, uh, one of the Cornish mystery um, uh, pieces from their cycle, um, where the body of uh, Pilot cannot be disposed of, but it just keeps coming back and it, uh, it keeps uh, poisoning things and, and it's just this most horrendous rank uh thing and it just the way they're discussing it there just seems oddly familiar um and that's quite interesting um i may be overstating that that's just one that came in um but we see i thought, Anjou... that, I, I thought that part you're talking about there could have been played um a lot more comically oh yeah you can do that on stage mm. I, I think there's a dark I think definitely a, nice, a, a small little interlude in all the mayhem and murder that's going on well, it's the fact that the bodies are imposing on, on the political yeah, exactly, a, arena yeah. as well. They bring the body on and then the, the Queen Mother comes in and goes, there's, there's a bit of a smell. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> clear, this, <laughs> clear this away. Um, and then we have Charles. Charles, who's not been desperately um, important. He's been a very peripheral figure. He had some speeches at the very top of the play and that's about it. Um, being a bit sad and ineffectual, and um, just 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 popping off there. Um, um, so thoughts about where we are now, um, Sasha. It's very fast paced. This play. It, uh, what I love about it is the fact that you never know what's going to happen next. It keeps you on edge every time. And I think certainly you're quite right. There's a lot of political choices being made um, especially from Navarre's part because he's been up until this point you know he's been pretty uh, he's been pretty focused on his path but now it seems like he's going to run away but actually no he's not he's actually got he's, he's he admits himself in that last speech there's something he's going to actually draw up a secret army to get to the bottom of this so uh, I don't know it, it, it reminds me a little bit of if we bring a modern context into it, a little bit of 007 um, James Bond uh, movies, especially the Roger Moore movies. Um, there's a lot of subterfuge and lots of planning and seeming like what one character's going to do and then suddenly it switches. Um, so it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, sorry, just in terms of some of the ridiculous murders with gloves. Um, yes. Uh, that, 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 that has an interesting crossover. Um, yeah. Uh, anyone agree or disagree or, or have a follow on thought? Wave at me, please. Liza. Yeah, I mean, that scene is kind of classic Jacobean tragedy stuff uh, with the, the fantastically elaborate murder method um, that you find in plays like The White Devil and The Duchess of Malfi. Oh, of course. Um, of course. Uh, and, and it's a murder with, I think, uh, it's, it's a lot more of an indirect murder than you find almost everywhere else in this play. Mm. Um, yes, it, it, it's, it's, it's almost unnecessarily complicated when they're just about to just murder everybody. Um, there's, in Marlowe's other uh, religious massacre play, The Jew of Malta, there's, there's, there's a yes. scene where um, uh, Barabbas, the eponymous main character, and his servant Ithamore 
come and, and see someone and the person says, what, hast thou come to murder me? And they say, I, and they stab him. And that's about the level we're at in this play. <laughs> yes, because the, 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 the cry that we get of, you know, two, 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 um, uh, is, that, that, is that actually a, a fencing term or is it because it's used um, frequently? French. No. To, to uh, French. Yeah. Uh, Christine, go. Uh, no, I was just going to say it's the French imperative. Kill, 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 kill. kill. Ah, so because it turns, uh, up, it has turned up in other plays. So, um, ah, because yeah, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know which other if the other play, plays also take place in in France, but at least yeah. here it, it it seems to be the the French imperative. Mm. Um, I mean, yeah. I wondered about the the distance in terms of or the complication in terms of killing uh, the queen. If that also has to do with the fact that she's a woman, right? I mean, all the other people that we've seen murdered. Um, so brutally are, are men that are standing in the way. Um, so maybe you can't kill a woman or Marlowe doesn't want to murder a woman in this play. So, uh, brutally, or it's brutal, but it's not the same, uh, same directness. Yeah. Um, so I wonder if that's, I wonder if that has to do with it in terms uh, of why some are complicated and some are not. I mean, thinking about then, you know, later with the Duchess of Malfi, when Julia is murdered by kissing the Cardinal's poison book, um, uh, I mean, there's so much brutality in that play also against women, so it's slightly a different, uh, different example. Mm. Later yeah, but the, the queen is, um, the queen, you're right, the queen is a woman, she's also royalty, and the massacre has not officially started at that point. Mm -hmm. I think that murder serves mostly to reinforce Catherine's reputation, the queen mother's reputation. Uh, it was, she was famed as a poisoner. Mm. Oh. And and the thing is that you know the the admiral's death is the starting pistol, isn't it? I mean, it's literally a starting pistol. It is it? It's a pistol shot, um, or a, a sniper shot from uh, from from that that is effectively the 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 the, the go uh, for for the, uh, the the massacre itself to uh, to go on from there. Um, even though it's sort of it's slightly delayed, um, probably mm. some rain. Um, but that 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 sense of different. Um, it, it, there's almost a class difference for the kind of murder you're going to get um, and, and the importance of how public it is um, and, and the casualness of, oh, no, he's all right. He's one of us. Uh, he, he, he's fine. Uh, he, he's with me, but no, he can die. Um, and the cynicism that is actually part of that, because um, we haven't really talked about the Guise's motivations, um, you know, in that big opening speech, you know, um, it's it, it's it's not like the um this this is this is fervent fervent um how how fervent is the the, the religiosity to this or is it a more a political battle if that makes sense um in this is it just simply they are they are othered therefore they must die and they are in our way um how how genuine um i think the the, the religion is the excuse the religion for, for Guise is the excuse for him to be the king. That's it. Mm. I think it's as simple as that. Yeah, because he doesn't seem very, very, very fervent. Um, one, uh, one more poem, Sasha and somebody else uh, wave at me. Go, Sasha. Yeah, I quite agree, actually. I think the using of the religion is just a game plan for him to do a political takeover. And on top of that, I think it goes even further in the sense that I think from based on what he's been saying, he's actually more focused on power. As mm. soon as you hit that throne, that's it. He's mm. won, yeah. you know. Okay, Liza, last, last point before we move on. I'll make it quick. Um, the, for the question, is it religion or is it politics? At this, at, at this period, the answer is yes. <laughs> um, the <laughs> Jesus yeah. were traditionally a staunchly Catholic family, um, their faction was out of power at court and the admirals was in power. So it's both. Yeah. Um, so we move forward. It's all joy and happiness. Uh, sound trumpets within. And then all cry, vive le roi, two or three times, two or three, no, no fewer, no more, but you've got a variation between how many times you do it now. Uh, so enter Henry crowned, Queen Mother, Cardinal, Duke of Guise, Epinal, Mugaron, Kings, Minions, with others, and the Cut Purse. All together now. Vive la Vive la Vive la 
Welcome from Poland, Henry, once again. Welcome to France, thy father's royal seat. Here hast thou a country voice of fears, a warlike people to maintain thy right, a watchful senate for ordaining laws, a loving mother to preserve thy state, and all things that a king may wish besides, all this and more hath Henry with his crown. And long may Henry enjoy all this and more. Viva Roy! Viva Roy! Thanks to you all, the guider of all crowns, grant that our deeds may well deserve your loves, and so they shall, if fortune speed my will, and yield our thoughts beyond, lead our thoughts to heights of my deserts. What say our minions? Think they Henry's heart will not, will not both harbour love and majesty? Put of that fear, they are already joined. No person, place, or time, or circumstance shall slack my love's affection from his bent. As now you are, so shall you still persist, removeless from the favours of your king. We know that noble minces change not their thoughts for wearing of a crown, in that your grace hath worn the Poland diadem before you were with vested in the crown of brass. I tell thee, Magellan, we will be friends and fellows too, whatever storms arise. Then may it please your majesty to give me leave to punish those that do profane this holy feast. We'll just pause as he's about to cut the cut Percy's ear. Um, a nice bit of royal power. Just to note earlier that the line, uh, there is a typo there. We know that royal minds change, not their thoughts. Sadly, not minces. Um, so <laughs> at this point, uh, the, they cut uh, of the uh, cut Percy's ear for cutting of the gold buttons of his cloak. How meanst thou that? Oh, Lord, my ear! Come, sir, give me my buttons, and here's your ear. Sirrah, take him away. Hands of good fellow, I will be his bail for his offence. Go, sirrah, work no more till this our coronation day be past. And now our rites of coronation done, what now remains but for a while to feast and spend some days in barriers, tawny tilt and like disports such as to fit the court. Let's go, my lord, for our dinner stays with us. And go all out, except for the Queen, Mother, and the Cardinal. My Lord Cardinal of Lorraine, tell me how likes your grace my son's pleasantness. His mind, you see, runs on his minions, and all his heaven is to delight himself. And whilst he sleeps securely, thus in ease, thy brother Guise and we may now provide to plant ourselves with such authority that not a man may live without our leaves. Then shall the Catholic faith of Rome flourish in France, and none deny the same. Madam, as I in secrecy was told, my brother Guise hath gathered a power of men, which are, he saith, to kill the Puritans. But tis the house of Bourbon that he meanest now. Now, madam, must you insinuate with the king and tell him that tis for his country's good and common profit of religion. Hush, man, let me alone with him to work the way to bring this thing to pass. And if he do deny what I do say, I'll dispatch him with his brother presently. And then shall Mounso wear the diadem. Tush, all shall die unless I have my will. For while she lives, Catherine will be queen. Come, my lord, let us go to seek the Guise and then determine of this enterprise. And they exit, and we move to a very different scene. Enter the Duchess of Guise and her maid. Go fetch me pen and ink. I will, madam. Exit the maid. That I may write unto my dearest lord. Sweet Mugaron, tis he that hath my heart. 
and Guise usurps it because I am his wife. Fain would I find some means to speak with him, but cannot, and therefore am enforced to write, that he may come and meet me in some place where we may one enjoy the other sight. Enter the maid with ink and paper. So, set it down and leave me to myself. Or would to God this quill that here doth write had late been plucks from out fair Cupid's wing, that it might print these lines within his heart. And as she writes, enter the geese. What? All alone, my love? Oh, and writing too. I prithee, say to whom thou writes. To such a one as when she reads my lines will laugh, I fear me, at their good array. I pray thee, let me see. Oh, no, my lord, a woman only must partake the secrets of my heart. But, madam, I must see. And he takes it. Are these your secrets that no man must know? Oh, pardon me, my lord. Oh, thou trothless and, and unjust, what lines are these? Am I grown old, or is thy lust grown young? Or hath my love been so obscured in thee that others need to comment on my text? Is all my love forgot which held thee dear? I, dearer than the apple of mine eye. Is Guise's glory but a cloudy mist in sight and judgment of thy lustful eye? Would, uh, were not the fruit within the womb, on those increase I'd set some longing hope. This wrathful hand shall strike thee to the heart. In strumpet, hide thy head for shame and fly my presence if thou lookst to live. And exit the Duchess. Oh, wicked sex, perjured and unjust. Now do I see that from the very first her eyes and looks so seeds of perjury. But villain he to whom these lines should go shall buy her love even with his dearest blood. So we've had two scenes in quick succession where um, the geese is not necessarily getting everything going his own way. Um, the sense that he was very much a driver in the first, uh, the first half or so. The play is, you know, preparing a massacre seems very much his kind of thing. And then suddenly we meet his wife and she's having an affair. What? <laughs> Where did that come from? Um, and, um, <laughs> it, you know, it's, it's, it's um, you know, and at the King's coronation, we have this sort of semi, uh, this, this strange moment with the cut purse who's trying to steal people's but buttons and things, who, who gets pardoned, um, uh, and the ferventness of the Queen Mother's ambitions herself, which is counterpointed and elaborated more than what we had with the geese. Um, and it's like suddenly we're being introduced to plot and stuff that you feel like maybe it would have been helpful if we had some of this a little earlier. Um, it feels like we're playing catch up. Thoughts, waggle your hands up at me. Thoughts, 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 thoughts. Any, anyone who hasn't spoken so far? Um, no, in that case, we'll just carry straight on. Okay, I've, I've obviously articulated everything. That's, that's all that needs to be said about that. Okay, we move into the next scene. Enter the King of Navarre, Pleshi and Bartus and their train with drums and the obligatory trumpets. Now, lords, since in a quarrel just and right, we undertake to manage these our wars against the proud disturbers of the faith. I mean the Guise, the Pope, and King of Spain, who set themselves to tread us underfoot and rend our true religion from this land. But for you, no, our quarrel is no more, but to defend their strange inventions, which they will put us with sword and fire. We must with resort minds resolve to fight in honor of our God and country's good. Spain is the council chamber of the Pope. Spain is the place where he makes peace and war, and Guise for Spain hath now incensed the king to send his power to meet us in the field. I think that's Greg, off the top of my head. Yes, Sorry. Greg. Sorry. And in this bloody brunt they may behold the sole endeavour of your princely care to plant the true succession of the faith. 
in spite of Spain and all his heresies. The power of vengeance now implants itself upon the haughty mountains of my breast. Pays with her gory colours of revenge, whom I respect as leaves of boasting green that change their colour when the winter comes, when I shall vaunt as victor in revenge. Enter a messenger. How now, sirrah? What news? My lord, as by our scouts we understand, a mighty army comes from France with speed, which is already mustered in the land and means to meet your highness in the field. Ha! <laughs> in God's name, let them come. This is the guise that hath incensed the king, to levy arms that make these civil broils. But canst thou tell me who is their general? Not yet, my lord, for thereon do they stay. But as report doth go, the Duke of Joyeux hath made great suit unto the king, therefore. It will not countervail his plans, I hope. I would the guise in his steed might have come. But he doth lurk within his drowsy couch, and makes his footstool on security. So he be safe, he cares not what becomes of king or country. No, not for them both. But come, my lords, let us away with speed, and place ourselves in order for the fight. And they exit, and we enter Henry, uh, King of France, uh, as he now is called, uh, the Duke of Guise, uh, Epinon, and Duke Joyeux, who I'm sure will be with us for long. <laughs> my sweet Joe, I make thee general of all my army now in readiness to march against the rebellious King Navarre. At, thou, at thy request, I am content, thou ghost, although my love to thee can hardly suffer it, regarding still the danger of thy life. Thanks to your majesty. And so I take my leave. Farewell, my lord of Guise and Epernon. A health and hearty farewell to my lord Joyeux. And exit Joyeux. How kindly, cousin of Guise, you and your wife do both salute our lovely minions. And he makes the horns at the Guise. He knows all his secrets. Someone did not delete their, uh, their, uh, their internet history. <laughs> <laughs> Remember you the letter, gentle sir, which your wife writ to my dear minion and her chosen friend. How now, my lord? Faith, this is no more than need. Am I to be thus jested at and scorned? Tis more than kingly or imperious. And sure, if all the proudest kings beside in Christendom should bear me such derision, they should know I scorned them and their mark. I love your minions. Ha! Dote on them yourself. I know none else but hoards them in disgrace. And here, by all the saints in heaven, I swear that villains for whom I bear this deep disgrace, even for your words that have, that have incensed me so, shall buy that strumpet's favour with his blood. Whether he hath dishonoured me or not, par la mort de il mora. And exits. Believe me, Epinom, this jets, this jest bites sore. My lord, twere good to make them friends, for his oaths are seldom spent in vain. Enter Mugaron. How now, Mugaron? Miss thou not the geese at the door? Not I, my lord. What have I heard? Marry, if thou hadst, thou mist have had the stab, for he hath solemnly sworn thy death. I may be stabbed, and live till he be dead, but wherefore bears he me such deadly hate? Because his wife bears thee such kindly love. <laughs> if that be all, the next time that I meet her, I'll make her shake off love with her heels. But which way is he gone? I'll go take a walk on purpose on the court to meet with him. And he exits. I like this not. Well, well I like not this. Come, Epinon. Let's go see the Duke and make them friends. 
And now this uh, this relatively sedate scene is there are alarums within the ki- the Duke Joyo is slain. Uh, enter the King of Navarre, Bartus, and his train. The Duke is slain and all his power dispersed and we are graced with wreaths of victory. Thus God we see doth ever guide the right to make his glory great upon the earth. The terror of this happy victory, I hope, will make the king cease his hate, and either never manage an army more, or else employ them in some better cause. How many noble men have lost their lives in prosecution of these quell arms? Is Ruth at almost death to call to mind? Good God, we know will always put them down, that lift themselves against the perfect truth, which I'll maintain long as life doth last. And with the Queen of England join my force to beat the Papal monarch from our lands and keep those relics on our country's coasts. Come, my lords, now that the storm is over past, let us away with triumph to our tents. And the exuant. And now we have it entering a soldier. And let's pull it, the, the rumour mill's definitely working its way through all levels of society here. Sir, to you, sir, that dare make the Duke a cuckold and use a counterfeit key to his privy chamber door. And although you take out nothing but your own, yet you put in that which you displease of him, and so forestall his market, and set up your standing where you should not. And whereas three is your landlord, you would take upon you to be in his until the ground that he himself should occupy, which is his own free land. If it be not too free, there's the question. And though I come not to take possession, as I would I might, yet I mean to keep you out, which I will if this gear hoard. Why ye come so soon? Have at ye, sir. And enter Mugaron, uh, who is uh, shoots it and kills him. Enter the geese. Hold thee tall, soldier. Take thou this and fly. Exit the soldier. Lie there the king's delight and geese's scorn. Revenge it, Henry, as thou list or darest. I did it only in despite of thee. And there is potentially an additional passage here, which we are not looking at at this moment. So we move straight to the stage direction. It takes him away. And now we enter the King and Epinor. My Lord of Guise, we understand that you have gathered a power of men. What your intent is yet, we cannot learn, but we presume it is not for our good. Why? I am no traitor to the crown of France. What I have done, tis for the gospel's sake. Nay, for the Pope's sake and thine own benefit. What peer in France but thou, aspiring Guise, durst be in arms without the king's consent? I challenge thee for treason in the cause. O oh, base Epinou, were not his highness here, thou shouldst perceive the Duke of Guise is moved. Hmm, be patient, Guise. And threat, net, and threat not, Epinon, least thou perceive the king of France be moved. Why, I am a prince of the Valois line, therefore an enemy to the Bourbonites. I am a juror in the Holy League, and therefore hated of the Protestants. What should I do but stand upon my guard? And being able, I'll keep an host in pay. Thou able to maintain a host in pay that lifts by foreign exhibition. The Pope and King of Spain are thy good friends, else all France knows how poor a duke thou art. Ay, those are that feed him with their gold to countermand our will and check our friends. My lord, to speak more plainly, thus it is. Being animated by religious zeal, I mean to muster all the power I can to overthrow those factious Puritans. And no, the Pope will sell his triple crown, I and the Catholic Philip, King of Spain, ere I shall want, 
will cause his Indians to rip the golden bowels of America. Navarre that cloaks them underneath his wings shall fill the house of Lorraine is his foe. Your Highness need not fear mine army's force. Tis for your safety and your enemy's wreck. Yes, wear our crown, and be thou king of France, and as dictator make or war or peace. Must thy cry place it like a senator, I cannot brook thy haughty insolence. Dismiss thy camp, or else by our edict be thou proclaimed a traitor throughout France. The choice is hard, I must dissemble. My lord, in token of my true humility and simple meaning to your majesty, I kiss your grace's hand and take my leave, intending to dislodge my camp with speed. Then farewell, Guise. The king and thou art friends. Exit the Guise. But trust him not, my lord, for had your highness seen with what a pomp he entered Paris, and how the citizens with gifts and shows did entertain him and promised to be at his command, nay, they feared not to speak in the streets that the Guise durst stand in arms against the king, for not affecting of his holiness' will. Did they of Paris entertain him so? Then means he presents treason to our state. Well, let me alone. Who was within there? Enter one with pen and ink. Make a discharge of my counsel straight, and I'll subscribe of my name and seal it straight. My head shall be my counsel. They are false. And Epinon, I will be ruled by thee. My lord, I think for safety of your person, it would be good the geese were made away, and so to quite your grace of all suspect. First let us set our hand and seal to this, and then I'll tell thee what I mean to do. He writes. So solemnly convey this to the council presently. And exits. And Epinon, though I seem mild and calm, think not that I am tragical within. I'll secretly convey me unto Blois. For now that Paris takes the Guise's pass, he is not staying for the King of France, unless he means to be betrayed, to be betrayed and die. But as I live, so sure the Guise shall die. And it seems like a very opportune moment to pause as the action has very become very Guise Guise centric as as power struggles uh, uh, abound. Um, He's, you know, when you can raise your own army, um, that sort of makes the king a bit worried. I, I think not unfairly. I think that's a very reasonable point from the king there. Um, that's, that's quite a lot of cash you must have lying around. Um, and that gives the geese the opportunity to sort out um, uh, personal scores. Um, the actual... Um, um, battle with the the the, the Duke Joyeux is almost incidental. I mean, the uh, the the, the Guise's personal personal triumph uh, triumph uh, trials rather. Um, so thought thoughts about what we're, where we are with the Guise, um, Sasha. The tables are turning, my friend. The tables <laughs> are turning. <laughs> It's getting good now. And um, I love the way that Marlowe has actually constructed it so that, um, you know, it's again the whole setting up with one action of a character, but then that sudden aside. And, you know, it's just that lovely phrase he uses in that final speech. And Epinone, though I seem mild and calm, think not, but I am tragical within. Yeah, right. <laughs> so in other words, you know, um, all is not as they seem with the king. And I think things are going to get very interesting from here. Hmm. Um, yeah, there's, it, it's, there's all these undermining and little little um, uh, bits and bobs. And the question of, you know, do we see the, Ju the Duke Joyeux die? I mean, the, the stage direct there is a stage direction for it. So um, um, it's again this question of what the action is doing around the text and the scenes that we've got here. Um, other thoughts, other thoughts before we go into the home straight. Uh, Liza. I hope that um, 
I, I hope that I'm not the only one keeping score of the various examples of same-sex affection in this play. Um, the king, for example, King Henry, uh, openly has minions, uh, which include both both Mugeron and Epenon, apparently. Um, and uh, uh, and uh, earlier on, Ramus and Talaeus is another possible example. They were they called themselves bedfellows. At this point, it was common for academics to share chambers. Uh, in Faustus, Dr. Faustus refers to having had a chamber fellow at university. But you know, um, we all, I think, are aware of the various ways Marlowe is said to have swung. So, um, so, so you know, just quietly keeping score here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, anyone want to pick uh, pick pick on uh, up on that or, or something else, uh, Lindsay? Uh, yes, I just I think that's a really really interesting point that Liza makes, and um, it struck me because when the Duchess of Guise is discovered several scenes ago writing a love letter to, to uh, Mugeron, um, uh, she is pregnant. Um, and one can infer that she is pregnant with Mugeron's child. And yet when Mugeron is advised um, that, oh, the, the, the Guise is very angry with you because of your relationship with his wife, he's like, oh, well, I'll just tell his wife to, you know, go hop, basically, uh, and I'll go out and I'll find, and I'll find the Duke of Guise, because that alliance is apparently more important than the one that he has with the Guise's wife, I, I, unless I, I was mishearing or misreading that as we were going along. That was what my impression was. Yeah, I would say you're pretty much right about that. Um, mm. we're, we're in France, guys. Everyone's in love extramaritally. <laughs> yeah, and I'd also add on, um, you're quite right, Lindsay, there is a political angle um, going on with, I can never pronounce his name, Mujulu, Mujulu, I'll call him for now. But yeah, I think there's definitely a political, ang there's a political angle from every character, I think, anyway, in this play. Um, but um, all is to be revealed later, I guess. Um, oh, yes, uh, Christine. Just kind of to, to go back to the Duchess of Guise real quickly. I mean, I think, um, I mean, Mujeron does say, oh yeah, I'll make her, you know, something about love, like make her leave love's heels or something like that. But it's an image of, of her kind of kicking her heels up in bed. So I think that there is, you know, a double entendre happening there where you have him kind of saying he will, you know, he won't worry about her, but he uses the language of, of bedding her again to do that. Um, and I think it's interesting that the Guise you know, we learn that she's pregnant from the Guise. And even though he sees that she has some other lover, he says, I'm not going to hit you. You know, I won't hit you because there's this child in your womb. Whereas, oh, there's a child? Why would you believe that it's his? You know, there's immediately a kind of, you know, as you say, why should we think that it's the Guise's um, child? But I, I, I can't help but just wondering, what, what is the point of the, of what is the point of the Duchess of Guise? I mean, the Duke of Guise, you know, he doesn't need that, you know, does Marlowe really need that whole plot line to set up the conflict between the Guise and the King? Um, because ultimately the threat of Guise uh, to the King is when he puts his whole army together. So I just was wondering if anybody else was kind of, you know, thinking about why we need this conflict between, you know, this kind of conflict over, uh, you know, about a woman and about honor between men. It, yeah, it, I, I think that's a really, really good point, because, you know, is, is it that we need to make it personal as well as political um, uh, to make the drama flow? Because I, I was very confused about that scene when it first appeared. It makes more sense to me now that, because it has payoff mm -hmm. and it continues and it, it's part of the Guise's decline that a more political animal would just, uh, you know, brush it under the carpet and say, well, you know, he's, he's you know, politically it's more important for this to keep things ticking over, um, uh, perhaps. Uh, thoughts, mm. thoughts in the room uh, on that? I it's a really good point. Uh, what's happening mm. with the shape of this play uh, now that we've moved out of the massacre? You know, that first, first act is massacre yeah. uh, And then another plot sort of coming on. Um, any, any hands? I see Liza, anyone else? So I just wanted to move, move the room around. Um, any others wishing to, to leap in? Uh, I will go to Liza, but I do want to move on and mow. Um, okay, Liza? 
Oh, just quickly. Um, well, you said it earlier that the, the Duchess is the point at which I think things start to not go the Guise's way, that the ground on which he stands is, is uncertain. Um, mm. And also to add to the general air of sin that Marlowe wants to project onto the Catholics in this play. Yes. Oh, wow. Well, um, yeah. <laughs> Um, and we, and, you know, the, 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 it also gives us the opportunity for the soldier to do his uh, lengthy um, uh, sort of double entendre sex jokes, uh, which uh, I think is actually a really quite fun little scene, um, in a sense, as a presage for the, the murder that immediately follows after it, so it's d dancing around light and dark. Anyway, let us rattle on. Um, and we go into a scene with, I think it's the King of Navarre next, isn't it? Yes, yep, it is. It is. So enter the King of Navarre, reading of a letter, and of course, Bartus, once again. My lord, I am advised, advertised from France that the Guise hath taken arms against the king, and that Paris is revolted from his grace. And hath your grace fit opportunity to shew your love unto the King of France? offering him aid against his enemies, which cannot but be thankfully received. <laughs> Bartus, it shall be so. Post them to France, and there salute his highness in our name. Assure him all the aid we can provide against the Guisans and their complices. Bartus, be gone. Commend me to his grace, and tell him, ere it be long, I will visit him. Yeah, I will, my lord. And he exits. Pleshy. Enter Pleshy. Who's Pleshy? <laughs> <laughs> I've lost my Pleshy. Ah, it's Ms. Uh, uh, Stephen. Yeah, someone else played Pleshy earlier on. That's why I... Oh, I right. It wasn't me. Okay, uh, just checking which page. 30? Uh, 36. Yeah. 36. Okay, I, I have it on 30, I'm afraid. So I'm going to go back ah. to 30. Uh, so the, 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 the Pleshies, uh, it doesn't say an awful lot, it just says my lord. <laughs> my lord and I go, my lord, yeah. Yes. All right. <laughs> um, enter, enter Pleshy. My lord! Pleshy, go muster up our men with speed and let them march away to France and Main, for we must aid the king against the Guise. Be gone, I say, tis time that we were there. I go, my lord. Exit Pleshy. That wicked Guise, I fear me much, will be the wine of that famous realm of France. For his aspiring thoughts aim at the crown. He takes his vantage on religion to plant the Pope and Popelings in the realm and bind it wholly to the Sea of Rome. But if that God do prosper mine attempts and send us safely to arrive in France, We'll beat him back and drive him to his death that basely seeks the wine of his realm. And exit Navarre, moving into the next scene. Enter the captain of the guard and three murderers. Murderers, get yourselves in position, please. Come on, sirs. What? Are you so resolutely bent, hating the life and honour of the Guise? What? Will you not fear when you see him come? Dear Ed said ye, tush, we're a year, we kill him presently. Oh, that his heart were leaping in my hand. But when will he come that we may murder him? Well then, I see you are resolute. Let us alone, I warrant ye. Then, sirs, take your standings within this chamber, for anon the geese will come. You will you give will us give some, some money. money. Oh, yeah. I fear not. Stand close and be resolute. And the murderers go to one side. Now falls the star whose influence governs France, whose light was deadly to the Protestants. Now must he fall and perish in his height. Enter the king and Epinon. Now, Captain of my God, are these murderers ready? They be good, Lord. But are they resolute and armed to kill, hating the life and honour of the Guise? I warrant you, my lord. And exit, Captain. Then come, proud Guise, and here discord thy breast, Sir Charlie, with Sir Philip. 
surfeit of ambitious thoughts. Breathe out that life wherein my death was hid, and end thy lifeless treasons with thy death. And enter the geese within, knocketh. Hola, Barley. Oh. Hey, Epinoon, where is the king? Mounted his royal cabinet. I prithee, tell him that the geese is here. And please, Your Grace, the Duke of Guise doth crave access, doth crave access unto Your Highness. Let him come in. Come, Guise, and see thy traitorous guile outreached, and perished in the pit thou mayst for me. The Guise comes to the king. Good morrow to Your Majesty. Good morrow, my loving cousin of Guise. How fares it this morning with Your Excellence? I heard your majesty was scarcely pleased that in the court I bear so great a train. They were to blame that said I was displeased, and you would cousin to imagine it. It were hard with me if I should doubt my kin, or be suspicious of my dearest friend's cousin. I assure you I am resolute, whatever any whisper in mine ears, not to suspect disloyalty in thee. And so, sweet cousins, farewell. Exit the king and Epinon. So, now sues the king for favour to the keys, and all his minions stoop when I command. Why, this tis to have an army in the field. Now, by the holy, holy sacrament, I swear as ancient Romans over their captive lords, so will I triumph over this wanton king and he shall follow my proud chariot's wheels. Now do I but begin to look about, and all my former time was spent in vain. Hold sword, for in thee is the Guise's hope. Enter one of the murderers. <laughs> Villain, why dost thou look so ghastly? Speak. Oh, pardon me, my lord of Guise. Pardon thee? Why, what, what hast thou done? Oh, my lord, I am one of them that is set to murder you. To murder me? <laughs> Fear them. I, my lord, the rest have ta'en their standings in the next room. Therefore, good, my lord, go not forth. Yet Caesar shall go forth. Let mean consent and baser men fear death. They are peasants. I am the Duke of Guise, and princes with their looks engender fear. Stand close, he is coming. I know him by his voice. As pale as ashes. Nay, then, tis time to look about. Down, Down with, with him! him. Down, Down with, him. with him! And they stab him. Oh, I have my death wound. Give me leave to speak. Then pray to God and ask forgiveness of the king. Trouble me not. I ne'er offended him, nor will I ask forgiveness of the king. Oh, that I have not power to stay my life, nor immortality to be revenged. To die by peasants, what a grief is this. Oh, Sextus, be revenged upon the king. Philip and Palmer, I am slain for you. Pope excommunicate, Philip depose the wicked branch of Curse Valois' line. Viva la messe. Perish, Huguenots. Thus Caesar did go forth, and thus he dies. Well, he did ask for permission to do his final aria, and having done it, he does indeed die. Enter the captain of the guard. What have you done? Then stay a while, and I'll go call the king. And enter the king, and Epinon attended. Oh, but see where he comes. My lord, see where the geese is slain. Oh, this sweet sight is psychic to my soul. Go fetch his son, for to behold his death. Exit Sir an attendant. So charged with guilt of thousand massacres, Monsieur of Lorraine, sink away to hell. In just remembrance of those bloody broils, to 
to which thou didst allure me being alive. And here in presence of you all, I swear, I ne'er was king of France until this hour. This is the traitor that hath spent my gold in making foreign wars and cruel broils. Did he not draw a sort of English priests from Doe to the seminary at Rheem to hatch forth treason against our natural, natural queen? Did he not cause this king of Spain's huge fleet to threaten England and to menace me? Did he not endure, Monsieur, that deceased? Hath he not made me in the post defence to spend the treasure that should strength my land in civil broils between Navarre and me? Tush! To be short, he meant to make me monk, or else to murder me, and so be king. Let Christian princes that shall hear of this, as all the world shall know our Guise is dead. Rest satisfied with this, that here I swear, ne'er was I king of France so yoked as I. My lord, here is his son. Enter the Guise's son. Boy, look where thy father lies. Ah, the slain. Who hath done this deed? Sinner, t'was I that slew him, and will slay thee too, and thou prove such a traitor. Art thou king that hath done this bloody deed? I'll be revenged. He offereth to throw his dagger. Away to prison with him. I'll clip his wings, or ere he pass my hands, away with him. Exit the boy. But what availeth that this treat is dead, when Duke de Maine, his brother, is alive, and that young cardinal that is grown so proud, go to the governor of Orleans, and will him in my name to kill the Duke. Exit, Captain of the Guard. Get you away, and strangle the cardinal. Exit, murderers. These two will make up one entire duke of Guise, especially with our old mother's help. My lord, see where she comes, as if she drooped to hear the new, these news. Enter the queen mother. And let her droop. My heart is light enough. Mother, how like you this device of mine? I slew the Guise, because I would be king. King, why so thou wert before? Pray God thou be a king, now this is done. Nay, he was king, and countermanded me, but now I be king, and rule myself, and make the Gizians stoop that are alive. I cannot speak for grief. When thou went home, I would that I had murdered thee, my son. My son, thou art a changeling, not my son. I curse thee and exclaim thee miscreant, traitor to God and to the realm of France. Cry out, exclaim, howl till thy throat be hoarse. The geese is slain and I rejoice therefore. Now I, now will I to arms, come Epinon, and let her grieve her heart up if she will. And exit the king and Epinon. Away, leave me alone to meditate. Sweet Guise, would he had died so thou wert here? To whom shall I bewray my secrets now? Or who will help to build religion? The Protestants will glory and insult. Wicked Navarre will get the crown of France. The Popedom cannot stand, all goes to rack, and all for thee, my Guise. What may I do? But sorrow seize upon my toiling soul, for since the Guise is dead, I will not live. Exit the attendants taking the body of the Guise, etc. We move into the next scene. Enter two of the murderers dragging in the Cardinal of Lorraine. Murder me not, I am a cardinal. Wert thou the Pope, thou might not escape from us. What, will you file your hands with churchmen's blood? 
shed your blood, oh Lord, no. <laughs> we intend to strangle you. There is no remedy, but I must die. No remedy. Therefore, prepare yourself. Yet lives my brother, Duke Dumaine, and many mo to revenge our deaths upon that cursed king, upon whose heart may all the furies gripe, and with their paws drench his black soul in hell. Yours, my lord cardinal, you should have said. And they strangle him. So, pluck a man. He is hard-hearted, therefore, pull with violence. Come, take him away. Yeah, it sounds like the stage direction lives in the middle of that line of dialogue, in fact. But we move forward, enter the Duke Domain. Uh, news travels fast because he's reading a letter with some others. My noble brother murdered by the king. Oh, what may I do to revenge thy death? The king's alone it cannot satisfy. Sweet Duke of Guise are prop to lean upon. Now thou art dead. Here is no stay for us. I am thy brother, and I'll revenge thy death, and root Valois's line from forth of France, and beat proud Bourbon to his native home, that basely seeks to join with such a king, whose murderous thoughts will be his overthrow. He willed the governor of Orleans in his name, that I with speed should have been put to death. But that's prevented, for to end his life and all those traitors to the Church of Rome that durst attempt to murder noble Guise. And enter the friar. My lord, I come to bring you news that your brother, the Cardinal of Lorraine, and by the king's consent, is lately strangled unto death. My brother Cardinal slain, and I alive. Oh, words of power to kill a thousand men. Come, let us away and levy men. Tis war that must assuage the tyrant's pride. My lord, hear me but to speak. I am a friar of the order of the Jacobins, that for my con conscience sake will kill the king. But what doth move thee above the rest to do the deed? Oh, my lord, I have been been a great sinner in my days, and the deeds is meritous. But how wilt thou get opportunity? Tush, my lord, let me alone for that. Friar, come with me. We will go talk more of this within. And they exit, moving into the next scene. Sound of drums and trumpets, and enter the King of France, Navarre, Epinon, Bartus, Pleche, and soldiers. <laughs> Brother of Navarre, I sorrow much that ever I was proved your enemy, and that discreet and princely mind you bear was ever troubled with injurious wars. I vow, as I am lawful king of France, to recompense your reconciled love with all of the honours and affections that ever I vouchsafed my dearest friends. It is enough that if Navarre may be esteemed faithful to the King of France, whose service he may still command to death. Thanks to my kingly brother of Navarre, then there we'll lie before Lutetia's walls, girting this trumpet city with our siege, till suffering with our afflicting arms, she cast a hateful stomach to the earth. Enter second messenger. Please, Your Majesty. Oh, go on, you carry on. No, it just said messenger, so I read it because I had messenger. Yes. But yeah, no, no, it, 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 is, it is you, I think. Uh, it is, yes. Okay. And it please, Your Majesty, here is a friar of the Order of the Jacobins, sent from the President of Paris, that craves access unto Your Grace. Let him come in. En uh, enter the friar with a letter. I like not this friar's look. Twere not amiss, my lord, if he were searched. Sweet Epinon, our friars are holy men, and will not offer violence to their king, for all the wealth and treasure of the world. Friar, thou dost acknowledge me, thy king? I, my good lord, and I will die therein. Then come thou near, and tell me what news thou bringst. My lord, 
the president of Paris greets your grace and sends his duty by these speedy lines, humbly craving your gracious reply. I'll read them, friar, and then I'll answer thee. Sancte Jacobus, now have mercy on me. He stabs the king with a knife as he readeth the letter, and then the king getteth the knife and kills him. <laughs> oh, my lord, <laughs> let him... <laughs> Sorry, distracted by the violence. Oh, my lord, let him live a while. No, let the villain die, and feel in hell just torments for his treachery. What? Is your highness hurt? Yes, Navarre, but not to death, I hope. God shield your grace from such a sudden death. Go call a surgeon, hither straight. And an, e uh, an attendant exits for help. What irreligious pagans parts be these? Such a horde them of the holy church. Take hence the damned villain now from my sight. And they take the body away. Ah, oh, had your highness let him live, we might have punished him for his deserts. Sweet Epinon, all rebels under heaven shall take example by his punishment. How they bear arms against their sovereign. Go call the English agent hither straight. I'll send my sister England news of this and give her warning of her treacherous foes. Enter a surgeon. Please, with your grace, to let the surgeon search your wound. The wound, I warrant you, is deep, my lord. Search, surgeon, and resolve me what thou, dost, what thou seest. As the surgeon searches the wound, um, there enters an English agent. Agent for England, send thy mistress word. What this detested Jacobin hath done, tell her for all this that I hope to live, which if I do, the papal monarch goes to rack, an anti-Christian kingdom falls, and his bloody hand shall tear this crippled triple crown and fire a cursed Rome about his ears. I'll fire these erased buildings and incense the papal towers to kiss the holy earth. Navarre, give me thy hand. I here do swear to ruinate this wicked church of Rome that hatches up such bloody practices. And here, Protestant, eternal love to thee and to the Queen of England especially, whom God hath blessed for hating popery. These words revive my thoughts and comfort me to see your highness in this virtuous mind. Tell me, surgeon, shall I live? Alas, my lord, the wound is dangerous, for you are stricken with a poisoned knife. A, a poisoned knife? What? Shall the king, French king, die wounded and poisoned both at once? Oh, that, that damned villain were alive again, that we might torture him with some newfound death. He died a death too good. The devil of hell torture his wicked soul. Oh, curse him. Not since he be dead. Oh, the fatal poison works within my breast. Tell me, surgeon, and flatter not. And may I live? Alas, my lord, your highness cannot live. Surgeon, why sayest thou? The king may live. Oh, no, Navarre. Thou must the king of France Long may you live and still be king of France, or else die, Epernon. Sweet Epernon, thy king must die. My lords fight in the quarrel of this valiant prince, for he is your lawful king and my next heir, or else his line ends in my tragedy. Now let the house of Bourbon wear the crown, and may it never end in blood as mine hath done. <laughs> Weep not, Navarre. But revenge my death. Oh, Epinon, is this thy love to me? And may thy king wipes off these childish tears, and bids thee wet thy sword of Sextus bones, that it may keenly slice the Catholics. He loves me not, the best that sheds most tears, but he that makes most lavish of his blood. Fire, Paris, where these treacherous rebels lurk. I die, Navarre. Come bear me to my sepulchre. Salute the Queen of England in my name, and tell her Henry dies, her faithful friend. 
and those definitely were his last words. He dies. Come, Lord, take up the body of the king, that we may be see it honourably interred. And then I vow so to revenge his death, that Rome and all those popish prelates there shall curse the time that ere Navarre was king and ruled in France by Henry's fatal death. They march out with the body of the king, lying on four men's shoulders with the dead march, drawing weapons on the ground. Um, yes, uh, we absolutely, yeah, the, um, you know, the play's ended uh, happily uh, with uh, where, where the, uh, the, uh, the right king is on the throne and uh, we're best mates with the queen. So, um, you know, that, that's result. That's definitely a result there uh, for the home team. Um, Okay, I'm going to put out a sort of question, really, uh, which is structurally, how easy is it to um, to enjoy a play where almost none of the characters are likable? Um, there, there's very few characters in this which we could openly say are sympathetic. Um, and it's an interesting you know, do is it possible to actually emotionally engage uh, with many of the people on this stage? Um, I may be overstating this point, but it's a question for the room um, to refute or, 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 or affirm, waggle some hands at this opening gambit as the play ended. Yes, Lindsay. Yes, I, I'm not really sure about that because um, as the play went on, I began to feel sort of more and more that it, it really was this sort of political, religious um, assertion of, as you say, you know, the right people won in the end and, and that sort of thing. Um, and it seems to me that it's it's sort of darkly humorous throughout and uh, it really, I could imagine it being done as a kind of, almost as a kind of, you know, black comedy farce sort of thing. And therefore I think um, for me, I would, uh, my sympathies with individual characters would very much depend on how they were cast and whether the individual actors playing them had a had a kind of wit or a likability that would kind of be making you root for them even if you didn't necessarily agree with what they were up to politically or religiously um, as opposed to anything other than that really um, that would be my my point of view on that I, I saw a script in hand performance of it about 20 years ago, which was exactly that. It was um, a poison knife. You know, it really was kind of, uh, you know, the, the moustaches were twirling uh, and there was that kind of element of sort of pantomime villain about it. And the, this sort of endless procession of ingenious deaths was part of the gag. Um, and maybe that's what a script in hand gives you, I guess, is that, you know, people are people are not necessarily going to be looking for their arc, but mm. um, you know, it, for what we, you know, if it's if it's the play in Henslow, then it's one of those plays that, you know, is a, a different play on the, the day after and so on and so forth. So that might that might well fit it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's sort of it's a bit like um, it's a bit like the end of Goodfellas or something like that as well, wasn't it? You know, this is kind of strange sort of over caffeinated dealing out of fates to people you know it, it, it kind of felt like a highlight clip from some kind of hbo gangster thing you know. <laughs> uh, so yeah. I, I completely agree with Lindsay, i think and, and i did see it i did say it d done very much in that vein and in a script in hand performance mm -hmm. Uh, other thoughts in the room? I set these hairs off. I'm not saying I, I hold them. Uh, Pamela. Okay, so I got really confused during the reading of that and I didn't really know who anybody was. And so at the end, then when you realise that loads of them were family and it was suddenly like, oh, this isn't just some random guy who went off to kill someone. He's actually the brother of the geese and the other one's also the brother of the geese. And so I was totally confused for a lot of it. So I didn't necessarily sympathise with any of them. The ones that I found quite entertaining and therefore that I probably kind of wanted to succeed in a weird way were like the murderers and the two guys <laughs> with the body and you know all the people that you could probably have the same people playing all of them 
but they were the ones that I was actually like, okay, I see why you're doing it. You're getting paid. I get you. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a tiny thing, but they were the ones that I found myself sympathizing with. <laughs> yeah, uh, Mr. McCabe. It's interesting that you say the, the um, right person wins in the end, the um, Huguenot. Well, from the so, play, but, playwright's yeah, perspective, from the I'm, talking, yeah, but, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm not saying... It. <laughs> yeah, he finishes it there for a particular reason. Yes. But in real life, the, the Navarre king, in within a couple of months, converted, converted to Catholicism. Yeah, but he also, he also promoted the edict of not, not giving Protestants uh, equal rights. Yeah, absolutely. But didn't you think that's a massive turnaround? Um, what do you mean? Um... Well, just in terms of history, or um, you oh, know. in terms of his own the, his own personal journey converting to Catholicism. Well, you remember his words: "Paris is well worth a mass." So he, yeah, he converted, absolutely. sure, but for peace, he wasn't a zealot mm. or a factionalist. Yeah, because well, you know it's very different to the Queen thing. Mother, who is is a, is a zealot. I mean, that, that's 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 the the difference between the Queen Mother and the, and the uh, uh, Catherine rather. Um, um, and um and the geese who's you know all about power for its power's sake and uh um well okay hang on catherine catherine is it's implied strongly that catherine is doing all this Lindsay, you know best because she's in love with geese rather yeah. than out of religious zealotry it's, i think it's both they're both there Probably. absolutely I mean, you're right about the geese you killed the wrong one is pretty much the uh you know the, the wrong person died in this in this event um uh, um, I mean, I was just going to add that, I mean, she's a zealot, but she's a, a zealot for power, I think, more than anything else. I mean, so she's, you know, she wants to rule, she will rule, she wants to make sure her voice is, is heard in France, um, and regardless of who's actually on the throne. So I think, um, I mean, I think what's interesting about the play is that it kind of stages all of these different people's kind of um, the, a kind of gradation of interest in actual power and ruling. Um, so, you know, you have Charles at the beginning, who's like, you know, oh, well, geese and mother, you can kind of sort this out, the whole massacring business, I don't really mind. Um, and then you get uh, uh, Anjou, who becomes king, and he seems interested in ruling, but ultimately, um, you know, also I think Marlo has a critique of how he's ruling as well, because he's a bit too maybe interested in pleasure. And of course you've got, um, you know, Guise who obviously wants to rule, and you've got Navarre who's the obvious, who will obviously rule in the end. So, I mean, I think what's, in and then you have the queen mother figure who also wants to command. So I think it's interesting how Marlo kind of stages all of these people's kind of, um, their, their ambitions, their desire to be all powerful and, um, so that you can kind of, as an audience, kind of hold these visions of power and rule up to each other, as it were, I think, and kind of think about, you know, even if you, you know, you know, even if some of them are, you know, mustache twirling and slightly ridiculous, you're still being exposed to kind of different ideas about right rule and, um, and, uh, and what just power, we might say, looks like. It doesn't look too ambitious. It doesn't look too zealous. It's not Catholic, obviously. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, 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 other th uh, thoughts about uh, if you were staging this uh, today, what do we do? What do we do with the text like this? Um, you know, what is this play to us or, or to the time? Uh, you know, what what do we do with it? Um, thoughts thoughts there. From ah, Alex, yes. Um, yeah, I kind of agree with Pamela. I, I have to, I have to admit, in fairly strong terms, this is one of my least favourite Marlowe plays. I and mean, I think, in general, I struggle with history plays because I'm not a scholar and I don't have that apparatus to attach to it. I struggle to get a present day resonance for it, and particularly being neither Catholic nor Protestant, um, I'm more interested in the Jew of Malta as a play because it kind of speaks to me more about my own personal cultural history. And I found it actually very confusing, even though I was reading most of it, kind of going, oh yes, it's that one talking to that one, talking to that one. Um, it's interesting comparing it with, because obviously we did Dido and Neas um, last week, which is obviously, 
even more remote in terms of time. But there's, even though we discussed Aeneas being a bit of a pasteboard character, there's something more, I don't know, I found Dido very psychologically realistic. And I think maybe the stumbling block here is that I'm trying to find these real people and actually, you should do it as a pantomime and totally send it up and have all of this ridiculous garbage kind of, you know, all these mentions of these far-flung people and uh, Byzantine methods of killing, really go for it, really milk it and play it to the hilt. And that may not have been the way it would have, it would have been played at the time, but I'm struggling, to, I'm struggling to see how you would do it otherwise because it requires such an in-depth knowledge of these events which are no longer really germane and because also they're set at one remove to us in in France it's not even like if you watch plays that I won't mention from the Renaissance period that deal with British history that are part of the shared culture of the country um, so I, I, I sort of agree I sort of agree with what's been said before um, I, I would personally struggle to think of a way that either I would want to present it and uh, that, that wasn't slightly over the top and slightly pantomimic or that I would want to watch it um, also as an audience member um, and I think also these days you know to talk logistically even before theatre shut down because of coronavirus um, this has an enormous cast that there is no theatre in the world that can afford to do this without doubling and that becomes even more bloody confusing when you're yeah. watching history plays <laughs> yeah. particularly when people change names or go by honorifics or change rank mm -hmm. so i think you would have to have a very shrewd director and i think again that's sort of almost breaking the fourth wall and acknowledging that you're presenting something that is artifice whether that's having a script in hand or whether it's almost having someone read the stage directions or, or point the characters out by funny hats or something would actually help with the narrative. It, it, um, it's that thing we are obviously missing here, a visual aspect. And, mm. you know, the play does introduce and there's no reason why those are, you know, that, that marking of, of, of who are the, uh, the, 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 the killers and who are the, the, the killed could not continue beyond the massacre, that that is something that you can use at least, because the number of characters who matter is actually very small. We just have so many peripherals mm. that makes it, and that, that doubling aspect is, you know, um, so, so tricky. Um, and, you know, uh, we've had, what, 10-11 uh, uh, in the room today, and, um, you know, we, we, we just about made that work. Um, it's, um, it's, it, but it's not ideal. Um, uh, of course, the elephant in the room, which I have deliberately not brought up, is, of course, uh, whether this is anything like the performance text that it was meant to be is, um, is, is, is a very important point. Um, this is, uh, this, there are plenty of plays that are not two hours long and, you know, are shorter of, of a purpose. Um, but there is, there is very much a sense that there is some severe buggering about going on with this text. Um, and I saw Lindsay waving in, uh, in uh, I, I, did you want to say something? Was that you or somebody else waving? Um, as I think she was. It, it wasn't, it wasn't me. <laughs> oh, it wasn't you. Okay. Sorry, Christine it was going, me, Chris, Christine. Ah, Christine, I've got a message uh, on that, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, so, um, um, so yes, uh, it, it reminds me from the podcast of when we were looking at Life and Death of Jack Straw as a, a significantly shorter play, which um, if you dig and delve, you find you find many more things than we can do here in this this short time. Um, but the question is, you know, it it, it it feels almost like the film script of the play um, that they've locked lots of things out for for printing. Um, uh, but uh, uh, thoughts on that um, is this is this the play that we're supposed to see and should we therefore adapt and should we do other things to this text to make it more performable wave from Sasha there well there's two ways we could look at this um, even just by listening to it um, as we went along I think in many ways actually it would it would work very well as a radio play because then you can actually get around some of the complexities by putting in appropriate sound effects, make it a lot more suggestible, so to speak. The alternative option is if you did do it on stage, if we're looking at a form of connection with a modern audience, I hate to bring this up, but remember when we went, we were going through at the time when it was being advertised on the news a lot, um, Saddam Hussein's terror? 
and um, a lot of um, a lot of the clash in religions there were happening at the time. So it may not necessarily be, um, you know, may not even necessarily be uh, the Catholics and the Protestants. It could they could simply be cover names for what's really going on, you know, in the sense you could look at, um, you know, Muslims versus Christians and but vice versa, just looking at that whole horrible conflict that happened, you know, that even if we just had a little connection with something there, because as I was listening to it, there were, there were, it reminded me very much about what was going on there at the time with Saddam Hussein and uh, Osama bin Laden um, at the time. A um, lot of weird conflicts, deceits, all sorts. I may be going off way off track here, but it comes to mind a lot, that kind of religious conflict, but not necessarily with this country, is what the media depicts. Well, it's a question of can we find a logical analogue that we might be able to find elsewhere. Um, and there was a radio version. The BBC did actually all of Marlowe's plays in 1993. Um, and uh, one of the things would be lovely if they'd actually release the damn things. Um, but uh, no, never mind. Uh, Lindsay. Yes, just following on from what um, Sasha was saying, it, it kind of just floated across my mind briefly um, unanalyzed um, whether one could do a modern version of it um, kind of set in the world of kind of boardroom coups and takeovers and you know uh, deposings of the CEOs and that kind of thing and whether there was a way of, of doing it like that that might be potentially could be sort of perhaps witty but I, as I say, that just floated across my mind. I haven't thought it through at all. The massacre at Goldman Sachs. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Marlow does suits. Um, yeah, I mean, it's this thing. We don't have to, you know, if we say that this, this text is essentially material, uh, um, uh, it is performable, but maybe we should think of it in a slightly different way. Um, uh, I think we've been a little down on it. Uh, any any more positives before we close off? Because it, it is now quite late, and I do want to sign off to everyone. Uh, so, uh, any thoughts, uh, uh, Eliza? I see, and I'll go around the room. Eliza. Yeah. Um, positives. Well, um, I first of all. I don't know if this play is as able to bear reinterpretation as some others, simply because it seems a very specific snapshot of a very specific moment in history written for a very specific purpose. But in terms of positives, I was wondering, I mean, I, listening, thinking back to what Alex said about not being a scholar and finding history plays a little bit inaccessible. And I think the job of a history play is to turn history into story. And, um, and you know, your, your penny paying audience tell them, okay, this is why France is our ally now and used to be our enemy. Um, and I wonder if one of the purposes this play was written for was not to generate sympathy and lessen antipathy against the Huguenot refugees who were living in London by then in very large numbers. Um, and, uh, and, it, and it strikes me that the, yeah, the play is messy. It's far from Marlowe's best, uh, but, but, but that might have been part of its purpose to say, you know, look, here's, here's why we don't hate these particular French people. Um, also, uh, there's, I mean, I don't know whether it's open and shut that this play is 100% Marlowe or whether, it, whether there are thoughts that it might be collaborative, but there are some there's a there's a lot of mess. There's a lot of characters who show up and then two seconds later they're dead. Um, but at the same time, um, the, there are some lovely, lovely Marlovian passages. Guise, in particular, you get the sense that Marlowe really enjoyed write, writing him. His first speech is just balls out Marlovian overreacher. Um, so you know. The, there's a lot to be enjoyed about this play, even if there are some things that don't behave as we now think theatre ought to behave. Yeah. And there's a question that you just minor uh, trimming or, or eliding of some of the, the minor characters might help as well, and just to crystallise the action. Stephen, I saw your hand. Was that a, just a, a reflex? Well, no, <laughs> well, it was picking up on both those points, really. Um, the, I did a little bit of work on the, on the, the BBC Radio Marlowe, ah. and... 
My recollection of it is, is, it, is that there was an awful lot of close to mic stuff going on. They picked out all of those speeches and that gave it a real sort of noirish feel. There was a lot of people kind of, you know, with their collars up, mm. sort of, to, you know, giving us the kind of direct access to what was going on. So the, what, what they did with that, if I remember correctly, is they took, took, took it right into the psychology of people at particular points mm. and, and let that kind of have plenty of room rather than worrying about who was who and what was happening. Um, that took us, that took a secondary role. And so that, that kind of, you know, they were all sort of horrible menacing figures who just kept kind of, as it were, turning to camera. Mm -hmm. uh, I, yeah. I, I remember the, the, the BBC one uh, was, 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 was actually very clear. Actually, that was, uh, you know, it's a sense of what was going on. Um, and, uh, uh, and one of those that worked very well out of that, that season. Um, I'd say it would be lovely if we could persuade however BBC Audio now currently works to, to release a, their box set of Complete Marlowe. That would be lovely, lovely, lovely. Um, still trying to figure out how to lobby to do that. Um, uh, additional thoughts uh, uh, before we close off then? That, um... Oh, I think we're, we've, we've reached a, a, a point with Massacre at Paris at this first look at it. One day, I'm sure we will return um, and, uh, and do something more with this because Marlowe tends to come around uh, quite a lot in, in, in uh, people's interests. Um, but otherwise, I'd just like to thank all the readers uh, that are still present and those who had to nip off early because some of them are in different time zones and really needed to go to bed. Um, <laughs> thank you very much to everyone. And uh, I will stop recording now. We go into housekeeping and bye all. Bye bye. <laughs>